This is Chicago. At the dawn of the 21st century, Chicago's media was dominated by a handful of major corporations. But a resistance movement arose to free Chicago's media from their clutches. One player in this movement is the Chicago Independent Media Center and its TV show, Chicago Independent Television. The Independent Media Center is a worldwide network of grassroots correspondents committed to using the tools of the media for promoting social and economic justice. You are watching this month's dispatch from the Chicago Independent Media Center. Welcome to Chicago Independent Television. A collection of progressive video reports by grassroots media workers produced free from corporate or commercial support or influence. In this episode, We'll go to the streets to join recent Chicago protests against the 2014 Israeli bombardment in Gaza. And we'll see the second of a four-part series of lectures about the struggle over freedom of speech and action on the internet, the policy known as net neutrality. Here at Exxon, we hate your children. We all know the climate crisis will rip their world apart, but we don't care because it's making us rich. That's right. Every year, Congress gives the fossil fuel industry over $10 billion in subsidies. That's your tax dollars lining our pockets. Making a fortune, destroying your kid's future? At Exxon, that's what we call good business. ExxonHateYourChildren.com. Mr. Bishop, I want to use this picture on the front page of our next issue. Oh, come down, Nancy. We can't print a picture like that. The paper is read by people all over the city. Just think what a picture like that would do to the reputation of our newspaper. I don't think we should hide things just because they're unpleasant. How do we stop things like this if we don't let the people know they're happening? Members of Occupy Chicago held a Christmas celebration called Occupy Your Kids, which included food, games, art, and of course, pointed political commentary. Welcome back to Chicago Independent Television. Chicagoans have taken to the streets in huge numbers to protest the 2014 Israeli bombardment in Gaza. Here is a report of those protests. The media hardly pays attention, and those living thousands of miles away in Gaza cannot hear our voices over the sounds of drone strikes. Can the Israeli government hear our cries? Do they care? The answer is no. In the world we live in today, dominated by capital pursuit, the power of the dollar sign carries more weight than do the cries of a thousand protesters. Make no mistake, while ideology is driving the occupation and the siege, it is money that enables the perpetuation of Israeli apartheid. I am sick and tired of listening to your one-sided reporting. It's an occupation. The Holocaust happened to the Jews, and now they're doing it right back to the Palestinians. I think that's completely wrong. Right now, it, it, right now, it always seems that the media is trying to portray um, the conflict or so-called conflict as an as a balanced, equal fight. Um, it is not. There is an oppressor, and there's 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 clearly an oppressor and an oppressed. Um, it seems as though the media is biased always um, towards uh, towards the Israeli government. Um, this is due to multiple factors, uh, but right here. You know, we're here today to pressure, pressure the media, pressure, you know, uh, U.S. citizens to take a stand and say that, you know, the, this, this news that we're watching, we need to be hearing about what's going on. And we need to be hearing the Palestinian story and the Palestinians' narrative. It's been going on for years. Obviously, you obviously know that. Um, Palestine's been under attack. People have been losing 
houses, lands have been taken over. I mean, it's gotten to this far, and actually right now what's going on over there is probably the worst that we've seen ever. The media reports that Israeli forces have more than hit more than 800 targets. That was of the other day, so probably it's over 1,000 by now. And they're hitting hospitals, schools, mosques, and homes, especially homes. Human rights groups state that the significant targeting of Palestinian homes is a continuation of something called the Dahiya Doctrine. The Dahiya Doctrine was started in the 2006 Lebanon War. It was a, something that Israel started to cause mass and excessive civilian casualties that is blatantly against international law, and they are continuing it in Gaza right now. We've all heard of the Kaweri family in Khan Yunus who had gathered on the roof of their home to protect it from a missile strike, and Israel bombed it anyway. Eight members of that family were killed. A high-ranking military officer told a Haaretz newspaper in Israel that jet planes don't care, and jet pilots don't care if there are people present in the house. If the house is targeted to be destroyed, they will bomb it anyway. And here's his quote. We will take down these homes, he said. Of the, if these people, like the Kawari yesterday, try to confront a plane in the air and the pilot signals that the plane's going to blow up the house, get out, because that house will fall. And we pray for those people. We pray for our Palestinian brothers and sisters, and we pray for our own Ahmed Hamad, who was at our rally last Saturday. And he's here today, and he learned on Tuesday that six members of his family were killed in a similar fashion. Chicago Independent Television presents Profiles in Cowardice with Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel. At the 2012 Montrose Beach Kite Festival, held the same weekend as the 2012 NATO Summit in Chicago and co-sponsored by the NATO Summit and by war contractor Boeing, Mayor Rahm Emanuel made an appearance but abruptly left. Why did he leave? Was there a policy emergency? Was the Kite Festival overrun by lepers? No. Chicago's badass mayor was running away from the combined strength of two protesters. Go public relations stunt, and everybody can see through it. You give kites to kids in America and drop bombs on kids in Iraq. You drop bombs on kids in Afghanistan. You drop bombs on kids that speak Arabic. No to NATO. No to the war longer. No to Boeing. Go home. We want a mouth mental health care 
murderers! And now Rahm Emanuel is off to go fillet some lobbyists. This has been Profiles in Cowardice. This is Jill Stein. You're watching Chicago Independent Television. Welcome back to Chicago Independent Television. The Federal Communications Commission is crafting its policy of freedom of speech and action on the internet, known as net neutrality. Chicago played host to a recent series of lectures on this topic. We'll now see the second of these series of lectures as an extended segment. Hello and welcome to lecture two of the four lecture series on net neutrality. In the first of this series of four lectures on net neutrality, we address some fundamental questions about the design principle and practice known most popularly as net neutrality, what it means, why it's important, how it could be violated, and what's apt to happen if it were to be abolished. The issue of net neutrality has gained increasing attention across the public, with points of high public interest that correlate to key points in the fight over net neutrality going back at least the last few years. But it was on May 15th, 2014, that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, by a three to two commission vote, approved to proceed, approved to proceed on a docket, now formally known as Proceeding 14-28, that would mark the commission's third attempt in seven years at formalizing net neutrality. The previous two attempts were challenged in court by internet service providers and were both defeated. The level of commentary and discussion and discussion for the net neutrality issue has now reached levels unmatched for any issue open, open for public comment in the history of the FCC going back to the Commission's founding in 1934. In this lecture, we'll explore the reasons why this has grown to be such an issue now, the reasons which are critically tied to the history of net neutrality and the U.S. government policy and litigation back and forth. One useful framework for understanding this is a critical distinction in communications law dating to the Communications Act of 1934 that, among other things, led to the formulation of the FCC. The 1934 Act includes a number of categories of media for which different policies apply. These categories of media are called titles, and for our discussion about net neutrality, the focus is on the first two of these titles. There's Title I, what's called an information service, and Title II, what's called a telecommunication service. Well, let's illustrate with some concrete examples. Indeed, we've already seen and you already know these examples. An example of Title I media is cable television, a business pure and simple, where the provider can largely call the shots. The provider has great leverage in deciding what channels are available, for what price, and you as a consumer are basically given the option to accept the terms or leave, or go without, or find another provider if one exists. And as mentioned in the first lecture, for the vast number of Americans, there is no competitive choice on cable, in the cable television market. That's Title I, information service. An example of Title II, telecommunication service, is a telephone, a provider of what's long been touted as universal service. The idea being, you have a telephone, and can call anyone else who also has a telephone with the telephone network allowing you to make your call while providing a strong degree of reliability without degrading your service or increasing or decreasing call quality if you pay more or less. As a result, a great majority of American society has had telephone and telephone access. To be fair, I am drawing broad strokes here. Cable television, which falls under the pro-business Title I classification, does have public service provisions like the establishment and maintenance of public access television channels. Meanwhile, the U.S. telephone industry has had a long sordid 
history of its own, monopoly control, smashing competitors, stifling innovation. But for the purposes of discussing net neutrality, this is the distinction that's particularly useful for the analysis to follow, and it also demonstrates what's at stake with the FCC's vote on net neutrality in 2014. In the previous lecture, we discussed the term net neutrality and the definition proposed by the man who coined the term, law professor Tim Wu. In brief, net neutrality is a network design principle which fosters a maximally useful public information network that aspires to treat all content, sites, and platforms equally. From the earliest days of the internet in the late 1960s until 2002, that principle of equal treatment was the governing policy for the internet in the United States. So what changed in 2002? In that year, the Federal Communications Commission carried out a little known decision that seriously wounded net neutrality. The FCC in 2002, by a three to one party line vote that got barely any media coverage, the FCC voted to reclassify cable modems from their Title II status of universal service and public access to Title I, controlled by business for business. This would mean that the internet, which increasingly was being offered as a service by cable companies, was now theoretically on the same legal standing as cable television with all the blatant money-grubbing and poor quality we've come to expect from most cable TV. The chair of the FCC at the time was Michael Powell, probably best known as the son of former General and Secretary of State Colin Powell. But back in 2002, the same year that the Powell-led FCC made a little-known reclassification decision, Tim Wu wrote an academic paper entitled Network Neutrality, Broadband Discrimination which coined the term that would gain widespread usage for the policy of non-discrimination on the internet. The FCC's decision to reclassify cable modems was challenged when a small internet service provider from California with the less than imaginative name Brand X wanted to use cable connections owned by the cable providers to provide internet service. But they could not because of that 2002 reclassification. Brand X then sued the FCC and the suit worked its way all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, when the Supreme Court ruled in a mixed 6-3 to three decision in 2005 that af affirmed the FCC's decision to reclassify cable modems as a business rather than as a public service. That decision affirmed the FCC's right. Indeed, in... in the FCC in 2005 would go on to also reclassify telephone modems in addition to cable modems from Title II to Title I, also along party line votes. But those decisions, as encouraging as the Internet Service Cartel found them, did not lock those decisions into a permanent state. They could be reclassified back. And the fight was now on in Congress. In 2006, the main effort from the corporate ISPs came in the form of the Communications Opportunity Promotion and Enhancement Bill of 2006, abbreviated the COPE Act. The COPE Act had only lukewarm protections for network neutrality, and net neutrality advocates regarded the bill as a step backward for free speech and opportunity with the internet. The legislative fight over the COPE Act in 2006 marked a, the first full-throated fight over net neutrality. The COPE Act passed the U.S. House, with Illinois' own first district representative, Bobby Rush, serving as co-sponsor. Indeed, he was the first sponsor from the Democratic Party on the bill, in fact. But it was in the Senate when the efforts for the COPE Act derailed. Comparable legislation actually passed out of committee in the Senate, with a Republican Senate at the time, and with a Republican Senate at the time, the COPE Act's Senate equivalent probably would have passed. But shortly after the Senate committee hearing on the bill ended, the bill's main shepherd, the late Alaska Senator Ted Stevens, opened his mouth. Stevens was recorded decrying net neutrality advocates, but the effect was instead to demonstrate his own profound ignorance of how the Internet actually functions, famously describing the Internet as a series of tubes. That expression wound up gain, gaining widespread popularity and became an embarrassment to the bill. It was never brought to a vote in the Senate, and the COPE Act, as a result, died from inaction, thus helping the net neutrality cause. But the struggle continued, with the FCC as the main form of action. 
Michael Powell had left the FCC in 2005 to join the very industry he supposedly regulated. By the way, he currently stands as president of the biggest cable TV lobby in the United States. Powell's successor as FCC chair was Kevin Martin, another one of the commissioners to vote for Title I pro-business reclassification of cable modems. Kevin Martin approved action to support net neutrality, though given that the actions fell under a pro-business framework, that made it vulnerable to subsequent court challenges by the big internet service providers. Nevertheless, a challenge to net neutrality was brought to the Commission's attention. Indeed, it's one we saw in our first lecture, the throttling of BitTorrent traffic by Comcast. The FCC fielded the complaint and ruled against Comcast. Comcast instead opted to sue the FCC in response in the hopes of defeating the Commission's net neutrality regulations. Mission accomplished. In 2010, in the case Comcast versus FCC, the FCC's net neutrality regulations were struck down. By now, Kevin Martin himself also left the FCC to take his chances on the job market. He is now a consultant with Patton Boggs, a high-powered DC lobbying firm. The Republicans who had carved anti-net neutrality policies for most of the decade between 2000 and 2008 were now out of majority at the FCC. Barack Obama, who on the campaign trail had claimed himself an enormous supporter of net neutrality, was now president. Indeed, as president-elect, he said, quote, I will take a backseat to no one in my commitment to network neutrality, unquote. So with him being in the White House, there would now be a Democratic Party majority at the FCC. Obama's appointee as FCC chair was Julius Ganachowski, an investor, internet business entrepreneur, and media attorney. Ganachowski echoed Obama's concern with net neutrality and had a Democratic Party majority to work with. But he was nonetheless swayed by the corporate involvement in media policy. In the summer of 2010, Google and Verizon had struck a net neutrality policy deal which would grant net neutrality for landline communications but do without it for wireless communications. That matters greatly for the future of the internet because the future of the internet is increasingly moving to wireless and moving to mobile and away from landline and the web. The other Democratic commissioners at the FCC joined Genachowski in approving the policy. They felt that, imperfect as it was, some net neutrality policy is better than none, and that at least with a policy in place, steps could be taken over time to improve it. So, in December 2010, the FCC along party lines voted into effect a net neutrality policy. All this time, the internet remained in Title I business pro-business classification, leaving it vulnerable to attack in the courts, with no reconsideration of a reclassification back, back mentioned. Sure enough, a lawsuit against the FCC was filed shortly after they took action. This time, Verizon, who had been a party to crafting the policy that the FCC approved, was now suing the FCC to undo their own lukewarm version of net neutrality. And in January 2014, the FCC lost in court. Their extant net neutrality policy struck down. The First Circuit Court in Washington, D.C., which heard the case, Verizon versus FCC, did affirm the FCC's right to regulate in the interests of net neutrality, but not to do so as a Title I pro-business information service. By then, Julius Ganachowski himself also left the FCC for greener pastures. He is now a part of the notorious high-powered investment firm, the Carlyle Group. And in 2013, President Obama appointed as FCC chair Tom Wheeler, a former telecom and cable lobbyist. In the wake of the FCC's court loss to Verizon, Wheeler wound up crafting a policy that was the worst of all worlds, essentially recycling the failed policy that had been agreed to by Google and Verizon and allowing for the establishment of what was so-called paid prioritization among internet service providers, leaving the classification of the internet into the Title I pro-business black hole, where the FCC is ostensibly serving as a public watchdog. The actual policy is, like much of the FCC's history, that of a corporate lapdog. Meanwhile, during all this time, concentration among commercial internet service providers had decreased. Small-scale ISPs were dying like fly flies in the wintertime, reducing by 50% during the years from 2000 to 2010. And more than 90% of the wireless internet market is held by just four companies, 
with more than 60% held by just two companies, Verizon and AT&T. There are, to be sure, various initiatives to try to bring some alternative against the bondage of the incumbent internet service cartel. Things like gigabit internet initiatives, community internet efforts, including those underway presently in Chicago, and even large corporate non-ISP efforts along the lines of Google Fiber. Whether or not those efforts succeed remains to be seen. But one thing is certain. If the legal standing of the internet gets changed, you can bet that the actual practice of the internet or what most people think of as the internet, will also change. The big ISPs even admitted as such. For example, Ed Whitaker, the former CEO of AT&T, in an interview with Business Week magazine in 2005, said that users and producers on the internet, quote, would like to use my pipes for free, but I ain't going to let them do that, unquote. To be sure, the picture I painted in this lecture has not been encouraging, with public policy facing loss after loss, big corporations having a disproportionate influence on policy, and those who craft the policy jumping ship to join the very industry at play. But the policy I've told here represents just one portion of the history of internet policy over the past decade and change. There is another story to tell, one which has been very encouraging and which represents our best hope for the future. There has been in the past decade a resurgence of media activism and public involvement in media policy, the likes of which America has not seen in a generation. It has a number of achievements to its credit, and among those achievements is a dramatic win amid the crafting of the FCC's net neutrality provisions in 2014. The popular outrage fueling it that won the classification of the Internet from P P Title II Pro-Public Telecommunications Service to a Title I Pro-Corporate Information Service. The overwhelming public outcry over the FCC's policy proposal in barely a month's time forced onto the table the reclassification of the internet back from pro-corporate to pro-public that in the way that net neutrality so desperately needs. The response forced a massive freakout from the corporate ISPs who have taken to arms the policy fight to come in 2014. Of course, the popular efforts that won that battle are not perfect. They have their flaws and their weaknesses, but they also have tremendous strengths and the potential to grow and mature. We will discuss that popular movement and their st story in the history of recent internet policy in the next lecture. Sorry. This is Jeremy Scahill and you're watching Chicago Independent Television. Make ChicagoActivism.org your homepage. All the news, events, and contacts for activism in Chicago. The Chicago Activism News aggregates content from over 100 activist organizations from around Chicago and Illinois. There is also a search bar along the top if you want to search the web using Google, making it convenient to have ChicagoActivism.org your homepage.